Um, his name is Richard Snyder, and he was the director of the Center for Environmental Diagnostics and Bioremediation at the University of West Florida during and after the, the BP oil well failure in 2010. Um, and he is currently a professor and director at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science um, Eastern Shore Laboratory at the College of William and Mary in Virginia. All right, so uh, I was at the University of West Florida for the oil spill at the Center for Environmental Diagnostics and Bioremediation. Uh, Wade Jeffrey there and I did a lot of oil spill work associated with Gomery and Deep Sea Sea Image uh, Consortia, Florida Institute of Oceanography. Um, Fred Heilman and Melissa Hagee did a lot of the analytical work that we ended up doing there. So this, like, like Marcus said, the, these things don't happen in a vacuum. It is, it is really a team effort. And, and I'm just a spokesman for a lot of things that go on. What, what I would like to do today is, is, is initially talk about the context of oil in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, and then talk about oil in general, sort of the nature of oil. And then I'll get into some data that we collected. Uh, but the talk is really gonna be more general about oil and, and the oil spill itself rather than uh, a scientific presentation. So uh, oil is no stranger to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, there are records in the Spanish uh, exploration ship logs of, of running through oil spills. Native Americans used the tar that washed up on the beach to waterproof the inside of their clay vessels. And, and this paper that you see from 1910 uh, by, by someone from the Coast Guard documented floating oil in the Gulf of Mexico long before there was ever any exploration for oil there. So, so oil has been part of the Gulf of Mexico ecosystem for a long time. And, and from bacterial use of the oil, it enters the food web, and oil is a significant part of the food web in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, most of the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico is, is relatively featureless. So you're looking at a mud bottom from a, from a mile or so deep in the Gulf of Mexico, and this is from uh, NOAA's Oceanus Explorer. They'll send real a live video feed from the bottom of the ocean to your desktop if you ever want to waste a lot of time. It's quite fascinating. Uh, they spent some time in the Gulf of Mexico, and, uh, and yet you run across, across places like this in the Gulf of Mexico bottom uh, that, that seem uh, otherworldly. The, the black is anaerobic sediment, and the brown is because it's oxidized. There's oxygen available there. And why the difference here between the brown and the black is there are brine pools that are on the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. It's, it's like having a pool of water under the ocean. And, and coming out of these brine pools, uh, you see features like this. And I'd like to focus in on this little volcano structure down here. If you look at the top of that right there, right there is an oil droplet coming out of the Gulf of Mexico on this video. From, it was a video. And I, I was grabbing stills like crazy when this was happening. And you could sit and watch this oil droplet grow and then pop off and head to the surface. And another one would start to grow in its place. And, and so the, you're watching oil emerging from the Gulf of Mexico seafloor. It hits the surface and it makes an oil slick. And, and so this is a natural process. These are natural oil seeps in the Gulf of Mexico that are occurring all the time. And, and if we look at these from a satellite, you can see them. They're all over the surface of the Gulf of Mexico. And, and uh, Marcus and I's colleague at, the, at Florida uh, State University, uh, uh, Ian McDonald, has spent a lot of time looking at, at oil seeps. These are, these are all the the proposed or, or estimated natural oil seeps in the Gulf of Mexico based on, on those oil droplets hitting the surface and creating those slicks. So, so oil is a, is a big part of the Gulf of Mexico ecosystem. The difference with this and the oil spill though is that this stuff comes out gradually and the bacteria consume it as it comes out. The BP oil spill is just a massive amount of oil that happened all at once and overwhelmed the system uh, in really catastrophic fashion. Now, what Ian McDonald and his research group did was use that, that ability to see the oil slicks by satellite, and actually they used radar, and the radar would bounce off the oil differently than the water. And they developed this cumulative oil spill map based on, on uh, radar bounce off the satellite. This gives you an idea of where the floating oil went distributed from the oil spill. And, and, uh, it, and a huge component of this was also the subsea dispersed oil. And if you look at this map, we're, here's Pensacola up here. And this feature here is called the Soto Canyon. So we were very worried about not only the floating oil that came in and as Marcus showed, hit the beach, but also the, the dispersed oil that, that might come up here and upwell through the Soto Canyon and up onto the continental shelf. And, and both of these things were of concern to us. 
Now, if you look at oil, oil is not a simple substance. It is a very complex mixture of all kinds of things. You have alkanes that are basically long chains of carbon, like pieces of spaghetti. And then you have various cyclic compounds. And, and some of these smaller cyclic compounds are known solvents that we use a lot. Uh, these degrade really quickly and they evaporate really quickly. People working the site over the oil spill, the, oil, the broken well, had to use respirators or they'd become overcome. It was just like opening a can of paint thinner. There's so much of this aromatic uh, solvents evaporating out of the oil. It was, it was astounding. And then this other group down here, the, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Polycyclic, many cycles. This is the group that we were most concerned about. These are the PAHs, and these are the, this is the group that has, uh, has a fair amount of toxicity. These things are toxic, too. These, some of these things are called brain cancer and other maladies. You don't want to go sniffing paint thinner. It's not really good for you. Uh, but these things evaporated really, really quickly. The alkanes disappear really fast for the bacterial degradation, uh, and the PAHs are, are sort of next in line in that degradation scenario. And then you get into really, really complex molecules where you start putting all those little pieces together, and you can get what's called a resin fraction, uh, where you start getting physical interference with the molecular structures themselves and, and make some viscosity to it. And then you get to the what we call the asphalt teens. And these are the really huge, complex molecules that, that uh, well, you know what we use asphalt for, right? We use it for roofs and roads. And people ask me, well, how long is the oil spill going to last? And I say, well, what part of it? The alkanes are going to disappear really fast. The, the solvents have already evaporated. And, uh, and you know those uh, road chunks from, from Hurricane Ivan out there from 2004, those are probably going to be there for 100 years or more. The asphalt fraction does not degrade very fast at all, which is why we use it for roofs and roads. That stuff almost physically breaks down faster than it breaks down chemically. So the asphalt fraction of the oil spill is out there, and it's going to be out there a long time. Fortunately, it's relatively inert and has fairly low toxicity. So public reaction to, the, to all of this was, was mixed. And, and I really love this photograph because it kind of illustrates this, this sort of mixture thing. This guy here, he's, he's all business. This guy here, he's, he's, he's wearing his life jacket and his hard hat probably because he has to. But I don't know what these guys were told or what they thought was going to happen. But they seemed pretty seriously concerned about uh, their exposure to, to uh, getting out and helping clean up the oil spill. And this lady is just out for a day in the beach. I mean, she's obviously not very really concerned about oil washing up on the beach uh, whatsoever. So what about toxicity? In order to have toxicity, you have to have the toxicity of a molecule, which we can define. We can do the tests and define the molecule-specific toxicity. But then you have to have exposure. And you have to have both the molecular toxicity and the exposure to have toxic risk. Now, every one of those different components of the oil have different toxicity. And as I said before, the PAH fraction is the most toxic, and those were the ones that we were most concerned with. Now, if you, if you think about this, exposure to petroleum chemicals, we live in a petroleum society. And, and actually, Vaseline, uh, 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 Mr. Cheeseboro in 1870, saw this white substance on the drilling rigs in Pennsylvania and developed that into to Vaseline. And, and we use this stuff as a, as a therapeutic for skin care. Paraffin wax is from petroleum. These are relatively inert, benign substances. They don't have much toxicity at all to us. Then we have a lot of machine lubricants. And if you ever stop by your, your, uh, your mechanic shop, you've certainly smelled some of this stuff. And, and I change the oil on my own vehicles. I, I get exposed to this stuff all the time. And there is some toxicity to these. We, we need to be careful about that. But then we get down to the PAHs, and these are the, this is, again, is the toxic fraction. But you can go uh, buy cold tar shampoo that is loaded with these PAHs, and that's why it works, because it has these PAHs in it. You can get a 5% cold tar shampoo down at Walgreens and, uh, and talk about exposure. You start putting that on your hair and in the shower, and it gets in your eyes and all over your mucous membranes, and now you're getting exposure to PAHs. So, so the... the we get exposed to these chemicals all the time uh, in, in society. So the other big factor of this that people are very, very concerned about was the dispersants. Now, dispersants are molecules that have a water-loving fraction that will be attracted to water and an oil-loving fraction. This is basically an alkane tail here with polar head groups, charged head groups. So this part's attracted to the oil, 
this part's attracted to the oil, this part's attracted to the water. And what it does is not dissolve oil, but it makes microscopic droplets of the oil and, and allows the oil to, be, to become an emulsion in the water. And if you look at this photo down here that Wade Jeffrey took, here's, here's a deep water horizon, oops, here's deep water horizon oil sitting on top of Gulf of Mexico water. And here's uh, the same, a, a similar flask with uh, the, the prescribed amount of Corexit in there. And you see that the oil is dispersed all through this. Now, now this, this compound itself is, uh, you can go down to Walgreens and buy this too. It's in Ducalax. It works as a laxative because it, it, it keeps the, the lipids and fats in your, in your system and makes them pass through faster. What this does here is increases the bioavailability and that increases the exposure, which increases the acute toxicity. So if you're a fish in here, you're not feeling too comfortable because you're swimming under order oil but if you're a fish in here, you, you've got massive exposure and, and acute toxicity that is occurring in this situation. But the other part of this is something that, that uh, Marcus just alluded to is the surface area. When you put surfactants in here, you create microscopic droplets of this oil, and then the bacteria have, have tremendous amount of surface area to attack the oil. If you're a bacteria in, in here, the bacteria have to be in the water. They can't live in the oil, but they need to access the oil. So they live in the water at the oil-water interface. And by using the surfactant, we create massive amount of oil-water interface for those bacteria to, to, uh, to break down the oil. So surfactants have been approved by EPA for almost over 30 years for use in oil spill work. And that's why they were used. There, it, it's not necessarily, there are no good choices when these things happen. There's only trade-offs. And the decision was made that we use the dispersants, increase the degradation of the oil, try to keep as much of it offshore as possible. And, and there's still people debating whether that was a good strategy or not. But we applied more of this chemical to the Gulf of Mexico than has ever been done before. And just massive amounts of this material were, were put onto this oil spill. So I was out in the Gulf of Mexico with a group of students during the oil spill. And this is what the oil spill looked like out there south of Pensacola, 50 miles south of Pensacola. And uh, we were collecting samples of it there and got samples of the sediment on that and a real education for those students. It was a real eye-opener to see uh, what the oil spill actually looked like at sea. Uh, we got back to shore, and uh, I, I set up these three transects that, that went across the continental shelf and covered DeSoto Canyon. Again, we were looking for both oil that might have sunk to the bottom onto the sediment and, and oil that was dissolved in the water. So over time, uh, this is the, the data for the sediments. And, and this is not oil, this is the oxidized surface of the sediment, the brown part. And again, we focused on three sets of PAHs as indicators of total PAH. And, and in sediment south of Pensacola, south of Destin, and, and south of Panama City, uh, over time uh, from the oil spill, we watched the PAHs disappear in the surface sediments in the, in the uh, continental shelf. Nowhere did we ever find whole chunks of oil that, that, that sedimented down to the surface of the Gulf of Mexico shelf. Uh, these are the samples that we took on that cruise where you just saw the floating oil out there and that was the highest PAH levels that we found. None of the values we found got anywhere close to establish uh, probable effects levels for toxicity and, and uh, ecosystem effects of PAHs. And in fact, most of these are well, well below what we find in most of our, our harbors and inland waterways. So we could calculate a like Marcus, we were interested in how fast this material is degrading. And out on the continental shelf, we had a, a, a half-life of about 228 days for, for these PAHs and the sediments. And, and really within two years, they were, they were pretty much yet not detect. And then uh, you saw the picture that Marcus had of Pensacola Beach. And yeah, it was, it was heartbreaking to see that happen. We started uh, a sampling program, monitoring program along the beach. And, and extended this into Okaloosa County at one point. We were taking water samples and sand samples and, and interested in, again, dispersed oil and oil that was uh, bioavailable to the organisms out there. So after uh, a short period of time, we could no longer measure the PAHs in the sand and the water. The water, the water disappeared really fast and the sand disappeared later. But then we realized that these always Potina are out there. If you go in the beach and see this like a beautiful little clam, big really fast. So clams, invertebrates, unlike fish and mammals like ourselves, they don't have enzymes to deal with PAH. We have enzymes that will detox 
and get rid of PAH as it goes through our bile and out, uh, out through our intestine, these guys will accumulate those, those compounds. And so we use them as an indicator of the bioavailability of these PAHs on the beach. And, and so you can see here, here's the sand and the circles and uh, in, in, in uh, UWF beach and Perdido Key. So, so you see during the oil spill, the, the levels are fairly high. And then as soon as the oil is shut off, the levels drop down really, really low. But then using the clams uh, and the clam tissue, we could, we could pick up those PAHs and track them for, for a much longer period of time and, and look at that degradation. And uh, fortunately, we had a couple of sample points that Escambia County had taken before the oil got there. So we knew what the background for clam tissue was. And, and so again, within two years, we're looking at, at getting down to the background for the clam tissues uh, out on the beach. So this represents the bioavailable PAHs in the system that would have induced toxicity uh, or ecosystem effects at that level. Now, again, the, any of the values we found, even these, these higher values out here, uh, are lower than what we would find in oysters inside Pensacola Bay. So there never was a, a really great harm to, uh, to the beach environment uh, ecologically. So how do we make, uh, you know, we, we talk about ecosystem damage, and, and part of this process is, is how, do you, how do you quantify that, and how do you put a dollar figure on it? You know, when I got to Gulf Breeze uh, EPA lab in 1991, we were working on Exxon Valdez work, and somebody in Exxon Valdez said, well, if I go to the bait store and buy a worm for bait, it costs me a quarter. And then you looked up literature values on the density of these worms in Prince William Sound and figured it was probably a loss of about $2 million, worm, $2 million worth of worms in Prince William Sound. And they got $2 million for loss of worms in Prince William Sound. I mean, that's kind of thinking that you have to, you know, how do you quantify this? And, and we can estimate ecosystems, so the nursery services for fisheries from seagrass and salt marshes and, and the, the economic value to tourism of a mile of beach and things like this go into these, these ideas of how you quantify things and how you ascribe damage from, a, from a, an event like this. But then you get to this thing here where I, I love this article and, and, uh, and right up front, you know, Mr. Westman here, Dr. Westman puts, but this wonderful quote from William Wordsworth and says, to me, the meanest flower that blows can give thoughts that do often lie too deep for tears. How do you put a value on that? How do you put it? I saw so many people that were devastated by the oil spill, just, just the, the constant barrage of, of every day on the news, the oil spill, and just people were depressed and, and very upset about what was happening to the, to the environment, way, way beyond any actual impairment to the environment, the emotional impact and uh, just the, like the said, the devastation to people was unbelievable. And how do you put a dollar figure on that? You know, if you're going to value the ecosystem in this fashion, and and it really should be part of the equation, then you know, how do you actually quantify that? Is a is a very uh, difficult question to answer. Thank you for your attention.